Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Vince, and I've been doing admissions since 1989 and college counseling since 1998 in California. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. This week in the news... We have a hot topic that about eight of you sent in to us to discuss. The article is entitled, The Dirty Secrets of Elite College Admissions, or a second title, The Supreme Court is Set to Kill Affirmative Action, Just Not for Rich White Kids. That's by Evan Mandery, October 31st, 2022. If that name sounds familiar, I just did a recommended resource of Evan Mandery's book, Poison Ivy. And Vince is in the saddle to discuss that. For a question from a listener, it's Lisa and Susan doing part two, the final part of their conversation about whether a student with chronic medical conditions should report it. How transparent should they be in their communication of their chronic medical condition to colleges? And for our interview, Lisa's joining me again to interview Brian Hodges, the Senior Associate Director of Admissions at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, part two of three, Understanding UIUC. And I'll be continuing giving you feedback on my recent trip to California where I visited nine schools. Linda Depker will join me to discuss Occidental College, better known as Oxy. Vince Garcia, Happy New Year, my friend. Happy New Year to you. Well, listen... um, There's a lot I'd love to talk with you and do this big preamble, but I want to dive right in. You address seniors. I'm going to address juniors. I've got a tip. And uh, this actually came up in a counseling situation I was in yesterday. A friend of mine reached out, a college counselor. But, you know, college counselors, it's good to get another perspective from another college counselor. Um, And she was just asking me what she thought I should do regarding curriculum choices for her child. And that whole issue of, uh, boy, if you take this rigorous class, the grade's not likely to be that great. So do we take it or not take it? And so the way that that I answer that question, I actually put it back on parents and students. And so I say, take the most demanding course that you can take, but all four of these other things have to be in place. You got to check the box on all four. And those are positive mental health, It's not worth it if you're going to give up your mental health. I say high grade. You need to get a high grade in that rigorous class. You take a a rigorous class and get a C, C minus, you know, D, it doesn't help you. I would define a high grade of at least a B plus. In in these days of grade inflation, I don't regard a B as a high grade anymore. There was a time when a B may have been okay, but there's so much grade inflation out there. I don't see a B in a hard course impressing any selective school anymore. So I would say a B plus min, a B plus A minus minimum in that range. Then I, then I, the third thing I say is school should be fun. It should not be drudgery. Do you really want to look back on your experience and say that it was drudgery? I don't think so. And then the fourth thing I say is work-life balance. In other words, you're not just a mind as a person. You've got other facets of who you are as a human being. You've got a spiritual life that you should cultivate. You've got physical fitness you should cultivate. You have a social life you should cultivate. So I say all those things need to be in check. Now, for those who are really astute regular listeners, you're saying, Stuck, you've already said this before. What's with the repeat tip? So the reason I'm actually giving this tip, I'm sharing it. And you know this, Vince. You know how when you, like, talk out loud, you think? You actually think? So then a fifth one popped in my mind. And and that's actually the new part, unless you hadn't heard me say this before. The fifth thing is your kid has to also want to take the class. The kid has to want to take the class because too many times it's the parent that wants to take the class and the kid doesn't. (laughs) So now I have five things and you have to check the box for all five. 
you can't check the box for all five, then I say don't take it. And so a lot of times I'll say this and I'll push back. And, um, you know, sometimes the kid a lot of times actually is kind of liking this because when I say it should be fun, it shouldn't be drudgery, you know, sometimes the kid kind of doesn't want to take the class. And then sometimes the parent is like, well, but if they don't take the class, are they going to be able to get into, you know, designer school? I mean, they don't use that term. I'm being a little pejorative here. You know, highly selective you. Are they giving up? Are they giving up that opportunity? You know, and what I would say is that's the wrong starting point. The wrong starting point is what does my kid absolutely have to do to get into super selective you? The, the right starting point is what is in the best interest of your, your, your student. And, you know, something Lisa says really effectively, I wish she was here because she could articulate it better than I can. But she often says, you know, when we're talking, parents need to accept the kid they have, not the kid they wish they had. And, and, and so, so once I throw that criteria up, then I say to them, guess what? You probably know better than I do. You as the you being the collective you as a family, you know, whether your kid is going to have good mental health, you know, if your kid can get that high, that B plus, you know, A minus type grade in there, you know, if they can have work life balance, if school cannot be drudgery, and if they can not neglect other aspects of their life, and you know, whether the student wants to take the class. So then the, the family can actually make the decision better than I can for them because they know their world better than me. So any thoughts on that, Vince? Yeah, you know, I think that that's really good advice. And if you're it's sort of, it, I, I think about it as akin to asking for a recommendation. If you see a student uh, or a teacher really hesitate, there's something about that, the moment of hesitation that they're expressing to you where yes. maybe there's some doubt there, they're, they may not say good things, you may not perform well in the class because they're doubting their own abilities. You can obviously play around with that and, and ask, ask about it but if a teacher or a student is is just not into it, you're really setting them up for for not being successful. Yeah, well said. All right. Well, our admissions vernacular today, uh, and I'm going to pull this both for the vernacular and the big number. I'm going to pull things from our article. It is the acronym ALDC, ALDC. And in a lot of ways, you know, this is similar to a book I've often quoted on writing the college admission um, essay where the author of that book was a uh, admission officer both at Brown and Columbia. And he talks about you can take the world of applicants and put them into two buckets. There's the just folks, which are the unhooked, and there is those with the built-in lobbyist who have a lobby for you. And this is at the most selective schools. And so ALDC is kind of similar to that. It's similar to his built-in lobbyist. So what is a what does ALDC stand for? The A stands for alumni, the L stands for legacy, the D stands for sometimes you'll see donor, sometimes you'll see development case, donor development, someone who can big, give a really big gift. And I mean a big gift. I've got a friend who does a lot of um, calls counseling with these families, and she always emphasizes to me, Mark, it's an eight-figure gift. It's an eight-figure gift, not a not a seven-figure gift, not a six-figure gift. So it's an eight-figure gift. And then the last thing, C, stands for Children of Faculty Administrators and Staff. So ALDC, and that's a transition into the big number. At Harvard, for white kids, 43% of all admits are ALDC, Alumni Legacy Development. Oh, sorry. Did I say alumni? I meant to say athletes. The A is athletes. A is athletes, L is legacy, D is donor development, C, children and faculty, administrators, or staff. So sorry about that. The A is athlete, not because I said alumni, then legacy. So correct that. And that 43% it's some, is actually low compared to some schools. There's some schools, look at Bowdoin and Bates, 40% of their kids were athletes alone. Just the A took up 40% of spots. So what are your thoughts, Vince, on that kind of rubric? Do you think it's helpful having sort of introducing people to this concept because it sort of explains kind of how a lot of decisions are made or do you think it's unduly stressful or do you think it's limiting what are your thoughts on that yeah it's it depends on your audience i think for a student to hear that 
I think it would cause undue anxiety. But I know at, I, you know, I was thinking about a school here in Los Angeles where they, where they were talking with, uh, with just the parents about the process. And when they stated this, this factoid um, to parents, it, it was like there was silence came over the room uh, and it really helped parents realize, oh, well, in, in the college counseling office um, perspective, it felt they felt like the people who wondered why why is it so hard, and why do some people have seem to have this you know open door into uh, certain certain schools, it sort of shifted their perspective and it helped the families create a more balanced list. But I think if you're talking directly to students, it might, it might um, cause an, an, um, undue anxiety because they realize like, I can't control, I can't, I don't have, I don't have those things. So therefore I'm not competitive. Therefore I should stop working. Yeah. So I come down on the camp that it's more knowledge is good. And I'd rather find out ahead of time than when I find when then then when I wonder why when I've done absolutely everything you could ever think somebody could do when it comes to my academic performance and I'm still not getting in all these places. What in the world happened? That to me causes a whole lot more anxiety. And then you've actually missed the chance to have a balance. You may have missed the chance to have a balanced list because you might be so top heavy that you could have had other great schools that you didn't put on there. So I come down on the side of more knowledge is good knowledge. More not, I mean, if you're explaining the way things work, then you're actually helping people, even if it's discouraging. The only thing I don't like about it is it doesn't tell the whole picture because athlete legacy, donor development, children, faculty, administrators, staff, there still are other institutional priorities, right? You have people from unique and interesting locations like in this country, it's always hard for people to get play, kids from places North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana. Sometimes a state like Louisiana can be really hard. Um, you can have underrepresented students of color, historically discriminated against demographics that are very, very difficult or a new country. Or you could have something else like um, high talent in the arts, an undersubscribed major, or certain personal qualities like leadership that a school has made a real priority to enroll. And so it's not the only hook that's out there. Um, so that's my question with it is it might be a little limiting and that makes people think there's just these four categories when there's actually, you know, some others as well. In fact, um, Henry Bald in, in the book I referenced earlier, he, you know, he, when he's, when he talks about those having a built in lobbyist, he actually includes um, underrepresented students of color in his group where the ALDC doesn't. So that, you know, that's my little beef with it. But anyway, that, that's, that's our acronym for the day. And it also shows up, shows up in the article. And the big number was 43 as in 43%. Um, I, I was tempted to go with another big number in the article, which says acceptance rate for Harvard last year, 3.1%. Acceptance rate for recruited athletes, 86%. So maybe that's a better big number. Or maybe you get two for the day. 43, 86. For 86 is double 43. So there you go. Two big numbers for the day. Any comments, uh, Vince, before we, we dive in the article for the day? Well, I, I'm glad you threw that that um, number out again. And, and you did a, a great podcast about athletes in college admissions and the work that Dartmouth was doing recently they realized that they had all these sort of obscure um, uh, recruitment pools, you know, fencing and squash, all, all these sports that that literally, you know, what was it, less than, I don't know what the number was, but that maybe 95% of America have no access to. And so... Yeah, it was higher than that. It was, it was yeah, it was something like less than 2% of high schools offer them. Yeah, and so suddenly you realize... Dartmouth realized, oh, we've got to, you know, that's <laughs> it's really biasing our pool and, and who's coming here and the type of student that we have. So I think what we're witnessing, and this is what the article will speak to, 
is a shift is occurring in admissions and we're going through another cycle. You know, um, when you look at the podcast gate cap crashers about Jewish people, um, you start to see, you start, you're starting to see a shift in admissions where they're trying to reevaluate what we're doing and how they're selecting students. No, that's a good segue, Vince. So let me tell people, because most people have read the article, so let me give an overview and let's dive right in. And now it's time for Hot Topics in the News. So the first thing I want to say is this article was sent to us by a really large number of people. When I say large, close closer to 10 than 5, so it was like you know, seven, eight. And that anytime we get more than five people send an article in, I know the article kind of splashing out there. And people send articles into us saying, hey, this might be good for you to discuss. I, I love it because it's part of a way of taking the temperature of what people are talking about out there. So this came in from a lot of people. And what is the article? Well, the article is called The Dirty Secrets of Elite College Admissions. So definitely one of those articles that's going to get clicks right there. Um, and the subtitle is, The Supreme Court is about to kill college admissions, just not for rich white kids. So it's got a much more provocative subtitle. And the author of the article is Evan Mandery. And if that name sounds familiar, if you're really super attentive, uh, just a couple weeks ago for a recommended resource, uh, the one I shared was Evan Mandery's new book, Poison Ivy. Um, that basically deals with this whole topic we're talking about today, but in a you know 300 page book as opposed to a, a, a this is a lengthy article, but um, so that's why if that name sounds familiar, this is in, a lot of this article is an excerpt from the book actually. So the article is really interesting because you have to read it really closely because when you first start reading this article, you kind of could get a very skewed view of where he's going. So he starts out and he he talks about a student named Michael Wang. Um, who he interviewed for the article. And Michael Wang tells his story that basically as an eight-year-old, he wanted to go to Harvard. And he says, he says, I know it's the Asian stereotype, he said, but to me, it was an avenue for social mobility. He wanted to be a neurosurgeon. And then the article talks about how his dad, Jeff, uh, had come over from Shanghai in the 80s and he, with a wave of uh, Chinese students that emigrated west. And basically, he really, really kind of reorganized his whole life with the goal of his kid trying to get in into Harvard. And so he watched the kids around them. He tried to emulate parents and their tactics. Um, all the way back in the fifth grade, Jeff persuaded the school district to let Michael into algebra. And he'd pick him up every day, drove him to the local middle school for advanced classes um, so that he was taking outs two in seventh grade. He finished BC Calc in 10th grade. He ended up with 15 APs, 4.64 GPA, salutatorian, perfect ACT, almost perfect SAT, and did piano, did debate, founded a math club. This is in 2012, by the way. And then he applies to 25 colleges, and he has all this optimism and satisfaction. He figures, okay, I've done everything. And then decisions start coming in. And starts out, he doesn't get into Yale. And then he doesn't get into Princeton. Then he doesn't get into Stanford. Then he gets waitlisted at Harvard. And then, um, make a long story short, he got into Penn and Georgetown, ended up picking Williams. But this thing still continued to eat away at him because he felt like he didn't get in because he'd been discriminated against because he was Asian. And so he did something that was unusual. He started writing the colleges. And he re wrote to them and he said, why did you reject me? I think I was a victim of discrimination. So tell me why... I didn't get admitted. And then he started following affirmative action. So he read all the Supreme Court decisions on affirmative action. He read the book, The Chosen. We've talked about a lot by Jerome Carabell about the, the secret history of exclusion at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Uh, Vince, you mentioned the podcast a, a second ago that uh, Gate Crashers, that's based on a lot of that research as well. And he's like saying, look, Asians are the new Jews. And so, you know, you're reading this article and at first it looks like the perspective that Evan's taking is really in line with Students for Fair Admissions, which is the group that brought the lawsuit um, against Harvard, because he goes, the article goes on to say that the, you know, the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights 
ended up, um, you know, uh, sorry, Michael files a complaint with the de- with the uh, Department for Civil Rights on the basis of of race. And then investigators from three offices of the Department of Education reach out to him. And then a lawyer from the department's boss's office say that we've been investigating Harvard since 1990. So you see him in the epicenter. Then Ed Bloom, who's we know has been the architect behind all of these anti-affirmative action cases and the Shelby Holder decision. He says, hey, we need somebody. We need a face on the lawsuit. Would you be willing to be the face? And Michael says yes. So then we have the Students for Fair Admissions, which is the group that we know has brought the lawsuit that's going all the way to the Supreme Court. And, you know, Vince, I, Julia, Susan, Lisa, we all think it's going, you know, uh, affirmative action will be overruled. So you're reading this article and you think, OK, it looks like this is kind of an argument, a pro-Asian argument that Asians are being discriminated against. This is wrong. Affirmative action needs to be overturned. In fact, the article goes on to talk about Harvard scale and when they look at personal qualities, they rate one to six. And then you look at things like integrity, helpfulness, courage, kindness, empathy, self-confidence, maturity, and grit, and school support. Asians consistently score low. And um, the clear implications is, you know, they're being discriminated against um, in, in the process. Um, and then it also goes on to reveal some other research done by a Duke researcher. Um I'm, be- I'm going to mess his name up. A R C I D I A C O N O. I didn't even try it, but I'll, I'll try it. Peter R C D N C O N O. His research showed that if it was just academics alone, Asians would be more than half the students at Harvard. Um, it shares information, like, for example, let's look at the specialized schools in New York City, like Stuyvesant and schools like that. Uh, they make decisions strictly off test scores, and Asians overwhelmingly dominate. Um, the student body. That's the essence of the start of the article. And so you think it's going to say this is really, really bad. Um, Asians are getting discriminated against. And it even uses the term we used last week. Asians are getting the label, getting labeled as standard strong all the time. And there's a quote in here. Oh, another Asian kid that wants to be a doctor. So you think, wow, okay, that's where this article is going. But then it says something that would probably really shock everybody. Um, unless you're reading it really carefully and you're following it, it goes on to say, I'm going to, I'm going to read to you what it says about uh, affirmative action. And then I'm going to make one more comment, Vince, and then I'm going to throw it to you because I've been talking for a while. So that turns its attention to affirmative action. And I know you're probably going to think, man, it's just going to excoriate and skewer affirmative action after all how sympathetic it was to uh, Michael and his case for Asian discrimination. But here's what it says. It's almost inevitable that the Supreme Court will dispense with affirmative action in the near future. That day will be tragic in a host of regards. And then it says reasonable minds can differ on whom should be given preference in college admissions. However, it's hard to argue against the preposition that Harvard and other elite schools, many of them were built with slave labor and the benefit of racist racist housing practices owe a debt to at least some of their applicants of color. But this obligation will almost certainly go on. So you're like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? I thought you were taking the case that it's the Asian Americans being discriminated against. Now you're coming out saying it'll be a tragedy if affirmative action is overturned. So what does it say? In essence, it says you have the Asian Americans fighting the people of color over here. But in reality, if you really want to see who's getting the spots, they're going to to wealthy white kids who benefit from ALDC, athletics, legacy, donor, children of faculty, and administrators. That's who's really getting the benefit. And it actually pinpoints um, eight different sports. It says, this is actually a quote from a similar article I pulled from another source. Sports like squash, fencing, water polo, swimming, equestrian field hockey, lacrosse, and golf just don't attract many underrepresented minority applicants. And they're the ones taking the spots. But meanwhile, the Asians are fighting it out with the people of color. So anyway, it was a longer intro than I wanted to do, but it was a really long article. I wanted to set the stage. Vince, what say you? Well, it was a, a fascinating article. And, and I, think, I think you did a great job describing the first half of it, where um, the author really lays out the case that there, there are some there are some moments in the admissions process where it seems clear that 
that Harvard, because they're the, the plaintiff in this case that's going before the Supreme Court, um, was really trying to protect a certain segment of their population. And if they had shown some flexibility, maybe adaptability in who they were admitting, this might not have come to the fore. It's interesting to me that this, this particular young man, Michael, applied, this was in the 2000, 2012 cycle. The author does a really good job sort of explaining to the reader that there are certain, certain things that uh, wealthy people have access to. He talks about research, he talks about sports. If you were to do an uh, independent research project um, of original research, or even non-original research, there are a lot of those opportunities available at almost, uh, or many colleges and universities across the United States. But you're literally pay paying between, um, I would say the low end is probably 2,500 and you could pay as much as $14,000 uh, for, uh, for that particular distinction. So whether it's sports or research, or uh, the author also mentions Model United Nations. When you look at the top Model United Nations uh, schools in the nation, they primarily, I think it was like 90% come from very wealthy communities. So what he's really illustrating here is what are the opportunities and how do we evaluate the qualities that, that uh, students bring to us? And he's asking that perhaps we could shift um, the way that we, what we value, and and maybe that's part of the new paradigm as we as we see a shift in admissions. And and what he argues is, and I think it does a good job, is you know if you're working at Taco Bell for 20 hours a week, where's that value, and how do we how do we note that in the process? The author is really arguing, let's reevaluate what we think is important, what leads to success, and widen the, the playing field. I think that's really the point of the article and why it's uh, so meaningful because it's asking admissions officers, parents to really think about like, what do we want from our students? Do we want tired, stressed out, anxious? always looking over their shoulder, not talking about where they're applying because everyone else around them is trying to come up with their perfect admission strategy? Or are we trying to build uh, or develop and foster talent, grit, um, cooperative spirit? Those are the characteristics that might help us shift the nation in a way that really is meaningful and significant. I think I saw the focus. Um, I I saw his focus being a little different than you articulated there, Vince. I'll essence of the article and tell me whether we agree or disagree. And remember, this is an excerpt from his book Poison Ivy, where he hits the ivies really, really hard. As taught, you can see it right in his name. Basically, talking a game of access and equity and diversity and inclusion. But in reality, nothing. Could, and it, but in reality, every step along the way, they preserve privilege. And and the author is also an alum of Harvard undergrad and Harvard Law School, and he teaches at John Jay, which is in the CUNY system. So he's basically saying we're the ones who are really doing things around access and equity. We're not the ones giving admissions acceptance letters to fencers that spend a hundred thousand dollars cultivating their fencing you know, their fencing habits so they can get into these places. So, so what he does is he goes through each of those things, the ALDC, um, and he shows the statistics for athlete legacy, you know, donor and recruited athlete. So for example, he says Harvard had a 3.1% admit rate this last year for alumni, 34%, donor family, 42%, child of faculty and staff, 47%, recruited athlete, 86%. And he goes into vivid detail. Like he talks about people hiring consultants and paying over a hundred grand for one. And one person paid like 1.2 million 
to do all these things to try to get into these places. And, and, and basically what he says is when you look at each one of these things, the ALDC, almost every single one of them is correlated to having money and resources. I mean, he even gives statistics like, you know, people that work with essay coaches and that money, uh, people that pay to get a distinguishing excellence and get that cultivated and they pay all that money and people that even statistics he uses on, on things like, like um, percentage of people with resources that take the SAT a lot of times versus people that don't and how you have higher score gains. So he brings out that thing about work and Taco Bell in his point of why, why is it that these schools don't value somebody working at Taco Bell the same way they do at some fancy smancy research opportunity that you know it took a parent with connection and resources? And he says they don't because in reality, they really don't value diversity, equity, inclusion. They just talk a really good game. That's the whole essence of his book. And this is an excerpt from it. And I'll share one thing and I'll get your thoughts. So I was talking to a family the other day. You know how schools always do their press releases when they, when they, re- when they release a new class? And so, you know, it was an Ivy League school and they were releasing, doing a press release on the kids that they had admitted. And the parent was saying, you know what? I can see by this description that they're not really going after somebody like me because it was a full pay uh, a full pay white family. And, and the, and the description was bragging about their number of students of color and talking about their Pell Grant kids and all that. But here's the thing. I got to thinking about that, Vince. A lot of that is marketing for the schools. Like they would never say 60% of our kids were full pay, but yet they make sure they travel and recruit and go to places and value all these things that ensure that 50 to 60% are full pay, right? They they wouldn't even say, guess what? Last year 31% were athletes. This year it was 37. Like they would never, they would never put that in their press releases. So they really try to talk up these things right. to make it look like there's this super high-level commitment to like diversity, access, equity, access, and inclusion. But in reality, when you look at who gets the spots. And if you look at, if you're familiar with the CUNY system, and you know where he teaches, he teaches a lot of non-traditional students, very high Pell Grant, very high first gen. I can imagine as someone who teaches at a CUNY school, it must be really hard to hear the elite schools preach to you about how committed they are to like diversity, equity, and, you know, inclusion, justice, social justice, when you know that you're the ones valuing things like working at Taco Bell and you know, helping out with the third job and being a non-traditional student that is 28 and is trying to go back to school and has all these loans. And you're set up for that kind of culture where that kid typically in these environments totally has imposter syndrome because they just don't meet that many people like them. So I don't know. I just, what are your thoughts? Like, cause to me, that was what the essence of it was when I look at the, his book and I look at the title of the article, but he set it up to have this whole Asians and affirmative action, they're battling it out over here. But while everybody battles it out over here, look at who's really going through the front door over here. Well, what are your thoughts? So what I would say, uh, going back to the podcast, is that I believe like that the author really was trying to point out, as you said, some of the discrepancies in where col- uh, elite colleges are really placing a high value on connection to to their particular school, and they define um, that connection through the ALDC uh, sort of category and, and other categories. And that there's a lot of space being taken up, and there's a lot of flurry in the press about how selective the schools are, but there's not a lot of transparency about what what it is what is it that they're valuing. And so they're placing a lot of the press is about uh, about affirmative action, but in reality, <laughs> if you add the two things up and you're outside of of you know affirmative action and ALDC, you're going to 
that door is a, it's not even a keyhole. It's like a pinhole to get through. So, so I, the re, the reason that I think that this article is so effective is that they're, what it's really asking us to do is to relook at, well, it's really pointing out what the, what the secrets are and let's focus the attention not on a group of, of the applicant pool that needs to, they need to be aware and they need to have more diverse students, underrepresented students in the process. But let's also look at where, where we're valuing certain types of students where other people in the U.S. have no access to ALDC. One takeaway I have for our listeners should be, you know, I said this once before, if you see that a school has a, pick your number, let's just say 15% admit rate. That doesn't mean you have a 15% chance. You could have less than a 1% chance and somebody else could have an 80% chance. That was one takeaway. Like really keep in, let's look in reality at who's actually getting in these places. Another takeaway is let's be honest about the role that privilege and resources is playing when it comes to admissions. And then another takeaway was kind of the point you brought up. Let's not value things that well-heeled families do over similar things that under-resourced and modestly resourced families do. You know, and again, the example being like work. You know, why should working 20 hours at Taco Bell not be considered as attractive as this research opportunity that you got with a professor? You know, I'll, I'll tell this really quickly, Vince. And it, by the way, it sounds like we sounds like we really are on the same page. We didn't, didn't have any disagreement now that you articulate it that way. I was having a conversation once with, you know what, I'm going to name names. So we, we, pull, we don't pull punches, we name names here. I was having a conversation with, the, with an MIT admission mission officer a few years ago now. It's probably about six years ago. And I said, what can I do to get more kids in your school? Yeah. Send us kids that do research and get published nationally. This is what he says. Send us kids who do research and get published nationally. And, and I said to him, I said, you know, every family I've ever worked with that's done that came from parents that were very sophisticated, highly educated, knew how to work the system. So if, if that's going to be, you know, what you're looking for, you've already created incredible obstacles because I just don't see modestly resourced kids and under-resourced kids getting those opportunities. Those opportunities come from... You know, he won't mind me saying this. Dave used his doctor, doctor marriage, used their connections to pair Lauren up with a MacArthur Genius Fellowship that had done research on the BRCA gene and, and Lauren had two years of medical research. That came about by Dave working his doctor network. Those are the kids that I see get those opportunities. So I think the, the article is called, as well as the book, are calling for more of a level playing field and more honesty, and more transparency, and, and a different value system. You know, it, we're starting to see trends in that way. Like, you're starting to see some schools say, look, put your household chores there, because if you have to go home and take care of a second kid because mom has to work until 8 o'clock, and you can't do extracurriculars, and you have to cook the food and do that, put that on your application. Because of groups like Questbridge and, uh, and others, I think you're starting to see some recognition of that Let's not discount that and be more attracted to something that seems sexier, like the person that did an exotic trip to another country or, you know, but I still think there's a long ways to go to level the playing field. So those are my takes. Any, any, any closing thoughts from you? Yeah, I think, you know, as they make this transition, and I'm glad that you pointed that out, you know, to, you know, to MIT, because I do believe that well-resourced parents will will do everything that they can to, to move that dial and make sure that the student has that opportunity. But for, for families who are thinking about survival, maybe not thinking so much about thriving um, in terms of you know, all these extra things that, um, that will keep you on the table in a selective admissions process, I think what would be really interesting to see is, is there some transparency and what, what is the research that these selective schools are doing to figure out how do we, 
how do we keep people on the same playing field when opportunities there's there's such a a vast difference there's there's a chasm in the in the United States about the opportunities that are presented and how do we how do we figure that out who who is the best match who has the determination who has the grit who has um who has the the talent and the potential to really thrive in these groups and sussing out those, what I would say are intangible characteristics will really take some, some hard thinking and research to figure out what those things are. I do think that there are, th there are resources that the article points out are available today for them to um, begin that evaluation process. And so I would encourage colleges and universities to take that into consideration and and look for look for the things that have made admissions offices more nimble you know the university of california and the university of texas they still have a commitment to diversity although it's it, it's not a criteria in their admissions process because um that race and gender has has slipped out of the process but what's emerged is this hybrid where they're still um, enrolling incredibly diverse and economically um, disadvantaged kids. The University of California, over 50% of the people they admitted last year came from very um, poor backgrounds. And, and it was clear that they had done, they'd done their work in terms of, of making sure that door was wide open for students who are thriving in less in environments where the resources weren't as abundant as other places. No, I mean, University of, of California, UC system, we get an A plus, 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 plus. I, I would argue when you look at so many other flagships, they're, they're a real outlier in a positive way. Um, in fact, we're going to do a, another podcast coming up. We're looking at flagships, especially Southern flagships. And look at how skewed they are to to people of means. But yeah, University of California, um, Cal States. I mean, they're leaders of the leaders of the class when it comes to to this. Last thing I'll say, Vince, is um, I think we all, but everybody in our team agrees, affirmative action is going to be overruled by this conservative court. The next thing it's going to happen, though, is it's going to start to put all kinds of attention on. How else are kids getting in here? And I think it's going to put a lot. I think legacy and athletics are going to come under tremendous heat as the next dom. I don't want to say domino to fall. That's too strong of a word because probably 20 to 30 years from now, there'll still probably be big advantages for, for athletes and legacy. And, and that's not to say, you know, I'm not of the opinion that ath athletics doesn't add. And you know my view, I think that if you have a very active alum who's been very involved, I'm okay with, with that counting. I don't think just because you can check an alumni box that you should get something. But if you've been doing a lot of work, and in my opinion, it doesn't have to just be donations. It can be you're leading up the class fundraisers and you're doing alumni interviews and admission interviews. I think if you're a contributor, I'm okay with a little bit of a thumb on the scale personally. But watch the scrutiny that that's these other ways kids are going to get in. I think you're always going to have, you're always going to have development. You just, you just are, if someone gives $25 million, it can help your institution. I don't see that going away. I think you're always going to have the faculty administrator and staff. People are working at your school. It can just be a retention issue. I know the UCs don't do, don't do a lot there though. Cause I've seen strong alumni kids not get into those UCs, but I think for private schools, there's always going to be a little bit of, hey, this faculty has been teaching here for 20 or 30 years and they're great. Like, do we want to run the risk of them, them putting their resume on the street because we didn't accept their kid? Um, so I think those ones are probably a little bit more stable. Faculty, administrator, maybe staff, might maybe not as much depending on how many staff you know, they're looking at. But particularly legacy, and um, certain niche, quote unquote, rich kid sports that the ones that are hardly played at all in high schools and that have incredibly have high average income for the participants that cost families like at least 20 grand minimum a year to do. 
those kinds of sports, I think, because you're mm-hmm. seeing it. Stanford dropped a bunch of them. Dartmouth dropped some of them. I think the, you might, you know, those are not necessarily big revenue generators. In yeah. fact, they're not. They lose money. They're funded by football and basketball, and sometimes another sport like. If you have another marquee sport, in some cases, women's basketball, in some cases, hockey, but rarely it's usually football and basketball. Alumni don't like that because of traditions. They don't like to see those sports right. go, but I think those sports are going to really start to fall under a lot of scrutiny once the affirmative action goes down. People are going to start to say, as, especially as these admit rates get lower and lower, people are saying, well, who's getting all these spots? And then lawsuits, lawsuits, lawsuits. So anyway, always a good discussion with you, my friend. And uh, you were one of the seven or eight that sent the article. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And I think, you know, another thing that I think might be an impact as well, and the article mentions this, is that I think you might see some of the admissions process, for instance, the writing of essays, that there might be a moment where people are like, okay, we're going to have a national, like, we'll be online and we're going to throw out a prompt and you have like one hour or whatever. I agree. I mean, when we did boarding school admissions, we did this. We did it for international students. They had to go into a room and get a prompt and hint. Because you think about it, schools could easily set this up. They could make you go to a writing set. Just the same way you had to go to an SAT center. You could have to go to a center and get your piece of paper and write something and tune it in without anybody... Uh, reading it over and giving feedback. And that that won't surprise me at all if we see that emerge in the next uh, decade. Yes, yes. And you see it, you already see it in Canadian colleges, particularly in the School of Commerce. They have, you know, they have two question shootout. You speak to it. They don't have the writing part yet, but they, um, but I could imagine in U.S. colleges, you're seeing that in the Marshall School of Business, they're using a, a similar the prompt comes out and the student speaks to it. I mean, if I was an admissions dean, I'd be tempted to do this. Yeah. <laughs> At a selective school. Yeah. You know? Who's going to proctor that? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know it's easier said than done because it opens up a lot of administrative things and cost and money and who's going to do it. I get it. But things don't stay the same. You know, change, change is always happening. So. Anyway, great conversation as always, my friend. And I always look I look forward to to our February articles. We'll see you next month. All right. And thanks again, by the way, for hosting me for that great Thank breakfast. You. Happy you New Year. Greg. I mean, that was um that was pretty special. It's really nice to get to spend uh spend a, a morning with you and, and your admission buddies. It was one of the highlights of my trip to, to Cali. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. Friends, last week you heard the first part. Now it's time for the second part. I went when I was on tour at Florida Southern. Um, our one of the students we who went on the tour with us was blind, and so I asked her, "How's it going?" She said, "Well, they're great, but they're always driving around with these golf carts and sneaking up on me, and I can't see the golf carts. They're and they're quiet, right? Because they're electric, and I can't hear the golf carts. So I'm I'm kind of terrified, you know." <laughs> Oh my gosh. Of the golf carts. And that makes me nervous. I'm like, well, surely maybe they could have a little bell on those guys or honk or something. You know, there has to be something they could do about that. But that's not something you would ever predict or think of, right? Until it happens to you. Unbelievable. In thinking about how, so that's a great example. If that student was on that campus walking around trying to understand what, what her experience would be like her sensory experience, how people treated her, right? the sneaky golf carts. um, (laughs) You know, you really, again, going back to what we were saying earlier, Lisa, it's it's that level layer of research where you really, and I think once you have done that as a family and you feel you've, you've got an institution that's going to be, help you maximize your experience, in a, in a genuine way, then, then you say to yourself, now I find a way to authentically represent myself in the application. Um, I think to be, to be covert is pro I think we all can understand why that might be a mistake. There are some families that say my son or daughter's disability has, 
We have nothing to explain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe you have nothing to explain, but when you look at the essay prompts that you have to write about, perhaps, or when you when you picture your application, you, there's your transcript, there are your test scores if you're choosing to submit them, and, and thankfully that's not the same issue that it, it has been, especially for students with differences. Um, when you think about the recommendations and the voices of other people, uh, you think about the activities list that kind of chronicles how you've spent your, your non-academic time. Then you say, now it's up to me to help the admissions people make sense of all these disparate pieces of information that could be the same person, but they could easily be eight different people. Right. But my, right. my own writing and my own narrative is going to be what, what pulls them together into a coherent picture. And I think that's where, where students really have to come at with, with their writing and their application is this is not an essay contest. These are not standalone writing samples. These are opportunities for a very particular purpose and a very particular audience to help that reader of your application make sense of everything else. Right, right. Like a holistic picture of you. Yeah, you got to back away and say, what piece of the puzzle here is not apparent when we just look at these, at, like jigsaw puzzle, where's that, you know, how awful that is when you get to the missing piece and you're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I don't do jigsaw puzzles. You know, my cat is always running off with the pieces and it's just, it's just a heartbreak. So all fun. The time. Yeah, no, it's terrible. But I, so I think what you're saying to, I'm hearing is like, probably these kids should talk about what they've been through because it, it shows who they really are as people. Their story wouldn't be complete. Kind of, right. and they wouldn't. You wouldn't make sense of everything if you didn't know a couple of things about them and some of the struggles that they've had to overcome. To the, it sounds right. like they're incredibly successful, um, you know. And so that's great. Now, question I have for you is, you know, kind of among I think admissions counselors, I've always heard like the two things you shouldn't, three things you shouldn't write about are suicide, eating disorders, sexual abuse. What are your thoughts? I thought it was death, dogs, and divorce. <laughs> so the, I, I, seriously, Lisa, that's the the old. You shouldn't write not about your dog. Funny. Dog, well, no? not or your dead dog. <laughs> no, uh, uh, who belonged to your grandparent? Right? Yeah, <laughs> I think I think you write. You don't listen to what other people tell you. You shouldn't write about first of all, because it's an, all in how you tell your story. Mm -hmm. That. And maybe this is contradicting what I just said, but I I actually feel the the topic of your essay, what English teachers call the vehicle that carries the meaning, right? That's what English teachers how they describe it. The vehicle actually matters less than the message. Right, right. Right. So whether the vehicle is a dog, a death, a divorce, um, or you know, the, the things you just mentioned. First of all, it doesn't have to be the thesis of, of the essay. This year, as I'm re and I'm reading a tremendous number of essays this year, and sometimes they're personal statements and sometimes they're in additional information. And I like that the Common App and the Coalition gives students the leeway of having two major pieces of writing in the application, one which is required, one of which is optional, but I don't believe in that word optional. Truthfully, I think every college appreciates more information rather than less information. Mm -hmm. More is better than less when you're telling your story and trying to bring yourself to life. So that said, you've got a couple of different opportunities to unpack your story depending on how you decide the pieces of that, that application are coming together to represent you. And remember, you're choosing your recommenders on the basis of what you know they're going to say about you, for Pete's sake. That's why you're choosing them, is you have a good <laughs> sense of how they're going to represent you in the classroom, in the lab, 
on the internship in, you know, whatever. Um, but then you're figuring out how to pull the rest of the story together. And because you have two opportunities, some students very effectively use one to kind of be more practical, a more practical narrative to explain, well, what are we explaining? Are we explaining the transcript, the academic journey, the, the family influences, the, the culture, the um, whatever goes on in your life in terms of, of influences? Those, the personal statements tend to address the common app prompts more directly. Additional information can be, here's a look into the parts of me that make me who I am in kind of a different, a different way. Here are some, you know, some challenges I faced and how I've learned to be a problem solver. The, the mistake that some kids make with discussing mental health, medical learning disabilities is they go kind of for the drama. Mm -hmm. Right. That's where the sob story aspect might come in. Yeah. Or just they, sh they, they're going for shock value. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. first of all, admissions people have heard it all before. Uh, they're not jaded, but there's very little that would be brand new that, you know, that they hadn't heard and students shouldn't feel that that they're the only applicant ever that might have to feel led to share something that is disturbing but what you what your thesis needs to be is who I am what my skill set is where where's my ego strength you know from my resi you know, when we say ego strength, that's determination and resilience and optimism that we all develop in reaction to right. challenges, uh, some of which are on the Richter scale of challenges experienced by teenagers. There are some kids at 10, like you mentioned, those true, those terrible traumas. Um, right. And that goes for the kids who lost their homes in mudslides and... Uh, or burned to the ground in a wildfire. Um, you know, there. Some of it's things that were done to you, and some of them were um, acts acts of God that you don't quite understand why God would do that. Um, <laughs> or, and and what colleges are looking for is your your ability to make sense of the incomprehensible, only according to a seventeen year old. Or eighteen-year-old brain, they're not expecting you to have the wisdom of the ages. Um, and then, where? How are you? How do you have a growth mindset? You know, it's not that you're a Pollyanna, and I know a lot of teenagers would, would have no idea what I mean by that. You know, <laughs> a, 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 that's true, right? They're like a what? A, a parrot? What? <laughs> you know, kind of the Scarlett O'Hara. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tomorrow's another day as, yeah. her, as her mansion is burning, right. <laughs> you know, behind her <laughs> and I'll never be hungry again. Yes. But, you know, trauma is real and kids have varying comfort levels in talking about it, but they need to understand what the colleges are going to be moved by is their, their experience, their being able to lift their chin up and whether it's taking care of the people around them um, or finding a way to salvage what they were able to, you know, what, what goodness they can find in the world. And again, it's not unrealistic cockeyed optimism. No, no, um, no. It's your real teenage version of the world. Right. And I guess like to my answer to kids when they, you know, about like the suicide, sexual abuse, eating disorders, is you can talk about things like you haven't met this reader, right? So you wouldn't just start out with, you know, the basic person you just met and say, hey, I was sexually abused by my grandfather. Like that would not be appropriate. But you could say that you had some difficult family issues, right? Or you could intimate it in a way that um, you would like more for someone that you hadn't, you don't know very well. 
And you don't have to give all the details in order to tell how you grew from that situation. Maybe right. that's a little sanitized to your way of thinking, but it's not. You're still talking about nitty gritty personal development and resilience. Um, right. And and I think every every s- student has to find their own balance in that there's some where, you know, it's important to be detailed. Mm hmm. You know, whether it's a diagnosis or a circumstance that created havoc in your family. But I would never want an applicant to feel that they were getting, like there were points that they were earning, like on the trauma scale. Right, right. And that they somehow can, sh- you know, again, this bit of bit of shock. And truthfully, the more, the more trauma that is shared, I... Uh, in the application, the more the student must share the recovery. Right, right. That's really important. Very, very important. And and I I read applications this week, in fact, where I said to my my co-reader, "Where's the help? You know, from when from whence cometh your help?" Right, uh, right. Mm-hmm. Because what we want to know is, you know, we feel so terrible that you experienced this. That's not the point. The, the at the actual point, the point is, how are you dealing with it, and how are you going to deal with it? We know you don't get over this stuff overnight. Trauma remains ingrained in our um, our personalities forever, but it's how do we begin to reconstruct a sense of um, well being and safety and trust. In, in a way that's commensurate with what happened, you know, the, but for, for kids who don't mention any, um, whether it's therapeutic help uh, or, you know, the, the trusted person they turn to or whatever, whatever it was, it's, it's the kids that are secretive, but yet sharing in their application that you worry about the most. Right, right. But you don't judge them. We 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 don't judge them. And you know, if the university where I'm reading applications for now said something to me that was really, really valuable in our training, which was do not fill in the narrative. So for students that are kind of touching on you know, almost like a skipping stone, you know, when you skip a stone on the surface of uh, 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 a lake and it bounces before it finally goes goes in. So that's how some students write. They're like, they they give you these kind of tidbits. They allude, they allude to things. That worries the living daylights out of people. Right, it, right. It, it does out of counselors as well as, because you realize... There's a, they're only sharing in that all, all sharing is motivated. You know, the kid has a, has a motivation, a goal for sharing information, but they're not showing kind of the, you know, that, that I'm on an okay road and I've had help in the past and it, I'm going to continue to seek. Right. Right. You know, seek support wherever I go. Cause that you know, but we don't we don't start filling in the narrative mm-hmm. on the college side when we're reading a student story. The temptation is to do that, right? That's a human nature, right? We want to like draw a line between the dots, but right. Mm-hmm. But that's why it is important as you disclose whatever it is as an applicant you feel you should authentically have as part of your your application that someone read it. Uh, and, you know, maybe not a parent, may, maybe a counselor, maybe an advisor or, you know, maybe not a peer, mm-hmm. but someone who might be able to look at you a little bit separate from knowing you and give you just a little loving feedback on how it how it's coming across. I think right. yeah. that no, makes a lot of sense. I think so. I mean, it seems like if as long as you are authentic, but showing resilience and growth it's probably fine and you can you know talk about almost anything right in the context of that but if you are being 
dr- like dramatic or provocative or revealing little things, but not others, you know, then that's going to make people worry because they don't see that you've grown from these experiences or that you're going to grow from these experiences. So that would be the thing to avoid. Yes. Or anything where you're, you know, readers of applications are mandated reporters. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, in, in the rare event when we read an essay and we do, where there is, there is um, abuse, mm-hmm. uh, whether it's veiled or or overt, mm-hmm. it has to go up the chain. Now, for a student where something happened a long time ago and they talk about their journey, their personal growth and therapeutic journey, generally it's it's not that doesn't rise to that level. But right, right. Um, every once in a while, you feel like, am I the first person to ever hear the student say this? Yeah. And then you're like, uh oh, you know, this is like, who cares about admission, not admission? We have a bigger problem. Right. Let's help this kid. Make make sure that they're surrounded by by support. Yeah. I mean, appropriate. I, I have heard kids say, I don't have anything to write about because nothing bad has happened to me. Oh. Right. I'm sure you said you know, there is yeah. a perception of kids out there that they have to have some terrible thing happen to them that they can, you know, talk about overcoming. But like nobody's life is perfect and we all overcome things all the time, you know. And so I, I think that that is not you don't have to go out and seek trauma kids to get a good college essay. It's definitely not required or recommended. I totally agree. You know, writing about joy, writing about gratitude, writing about um, extraordinary influences in your life that that changed how you thought about your own beliefs or or values or your your place in the world. These are deeply revealing and meaningful pieces of writing in a student's application. You know, and when I, when I read about um, a student who has who is sees themselves as marginalized or disabled or however they have felt labeled or treated and they talk about where their strength comes from, their power, their um, confidence is a very, you know, a deeply engaging and compelling essay. You really feel like you know that this student is going to be an important influence on your campus. You know, it was funny, many, many years ago when I was full-time admissions, students would occasionally talk about being in rehab. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, this was a different day and age before there was as much therapy out there and as much comfort. But occasionally we could always, when, when kids are, have been in a therapeutic situation, they generally acquire a language, a vocabulary that they learn. They they learn how to describe their experience. They learn how to describe their empowerment mm-hmm. um, in a different way because it's a very maturing experience, right? right? Right. And we used to chuckle, you know, a long time ago when a student would would talk about a. a Maybe maybe an inpatient therapeutic. They, maybe they needed to just mention it because it would show on their transcript that they had been in a diff- in a therapeutic school for a period of time or whatever, and they were writing about it. It was almost always extremely positive because these these kids knew how to talk about their journey. Mm-hmm. They had taken this enormous leap in understanding what made them tick and what their challenges were and how they were going to move move ahead in the future. And we used to say, you know what, this kid is going to be a fabulous influence in the dorms. Right. Because they like they like <laughs> are wise beyond their years, right? <laughs> and they're going to be able to say, you know, been there, done that. And let me just tell you Right, right. How sorry you're going to be. Right. <laughs> and it was true. I mean colleges really can view that though that skill set, that self awareness as a as a element of diversity in their student body, that can be a very positive uh, peer peer influence. Yeah. Well, I think that you know. So I mean, just to sum up, um, I think mom should have her kids write about what they've had going on with this idea of a positive trajectory and the strengths that they clearly have. 
And, you know, we also want her to look into the schools that they're applying to and make sure that those schools are going to meet her kids' needs, which is possibly even more important. But, you know, to thy own self be true, right? I mean, that's right. As long as you're not like being dramatic or provocative or, you know, playing peekaboo with some scary stuff in some ways that are alarming, it's probably okay to talk about things. That's a great way to put it, Lisa. The other thing I would say to her, there are two things. One is make sure that you have a conversation with the guidance counselor at school and the teachers who are writing the recommendations. I have been really shocked even this year to read some applications where the student says nothing about a disability and the counselor in the counselor letter in the school report or the teachers give diagnostic information Mm -hmm. or refer to chronic absences or they, they tip it. It's completely inappropriate. And someone obviously needs to be training school personnel that that's never allowed legally right. that they yeah, they cannot that. <laughs> yeah they can mm-hmm. uh, to name to actually name a condition or an illness i think that when students know who are going to be writing their letters of recommendation there's a sit down conversation about how the student hopes that adult will support them mhm mhm and that what that adult has observed and describes is of course appropriate um, from a position of advocacy. That's how I always used to say it is a position of advocacy, but I, I continue to be shocked. Hmm. I had no idea. That's very helpful. I know. I, it feels very like 19th century. <laughs> yeah. Like I did not read that, they, that. I did not read that. <laughs> you know, I like, know. And literally we do that. We have to say, we really, this, what if they have the wrong student? What if they are, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I won't even go into that with recommendations that sometimes oh. you realize you're reading a template from another mm-hmm. student, but oh, th- let's hope that that's not the case. <laughs> the other thing to this mom, though, is she refers to, are they going to be concerned about the possible cost of support? Mm-hmm. And I thought that was an interesting question because hopefully the supports are already there. Mm-hmm. You know, they were already in place. Right. So that won't so cost it's not like, anymore. No. Now there would be some conditions, some circumstances. I'm thinking of like um, sign language interpreter or, but those come out of social security disability and medical disability sources right, of information. Right. I'm not sure that, schools, colleges themselves are actually thinking, ka-ching, ka-ching, this is going to, you know, be expensive. Um, so mom, I, I wouldn't worry about that. I, but I, I would focus on what services are kind of in place and what's the, what's the attitude about accessibility and celebration. That's really fabulous. Thank you so much, Susan. You've given us a lot to think about. And um, certainly I've learned a lot from this conversation. I know our listeners have had the similar experience as me. So, um, yeah, I hope we can answer more questions together. We didn't even get one single argument. So, yay us. So <laughs> <laughs> Never, never. It just shows it's all Mark. It's definitely not me. It's definitely Mark. Uh, See, because no. I can get along we- just fine with other people. So, Well, he likes to stir the pot <laughs> the pot he does. a little bit he and does. I, don't bl- I don't blame him <laughs> hey i worked with them you know for 10 years that's right uh, you, know, you know all the yeah all the mark stucker tricks so oh <laughs> uh, but he a gem a gem of a colleague um, oh absolutely and now doing such a wonderful thing for so many people mm-hmm. no um, being on the air with this kind of material i just think it's, absolutely it's fantastic it's an honor to- and, and listeners keep those good questions coming we absolutely. we love this kind of yeah of stuff this is it's so helpful very helpful All right, great. Well, have a great day, Susan, and we'll be back soon. Thank you, Lisa. My pleasure. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, last week you heard the first part of our interview 
Now it's time for the second part. Is there anything I never mentioned that you just might want to highlight? I know there's a lot of programs because you guys have all the (laughs) agricultural stuff that's also really strong. Anything else that you want to share that maybe goes overlooked or underrated that you want to, as they say, give a little shine to? Sure. I hope I don't upset any anyone anyone else. But I have I have two. One sure. is financial planning. Okay. And that's actually in the College of Aces um, Agricultural Consumer Environmental Sciences. Uh, students graduate as certified uh, financial planner mm-hmm. in that program. Um, so you actually directly are helping people with their financial plans. Now it's not finance where it's more about Wall Street and goods and services, but you're actually trained on how to help people plan for their financial future. And that's, again, another business program outside the College Mm -hmm. of of Geese. Uh, Another uh, college or school I'll talk about is School of Information Sciences, or Mm -hmm. iSchool. That is the information science program is actually a program that focuses on the uh, user experience when it comes to data. So the individuals that are all over social media and kind of learning why people do certain things on social media. And a lot of people that are interested in computer science on the software side, but maybe we just want to know more about the user experience. That's a program that's uh, it's, that's growing, and it could be an option for students that are interested in that aspect. That's great. That's great. So what is the process for undergraduates to get research opportunities, and how hard is it for them to get those opportunities? I'm glad you asked that question because research is very easy for students to get involved in. We have our Office of Undergraduate Research where students want to be more on an individual basis kind of do their own thing. We have a research symposium that happens in the spring semester where students that have done their own research can present that to the campus community. So that's definitely an opportunity. Uh, one, and we usually encourage students to do this, is talk to their professors. Uh, we highlight office hours. And uh, I spoke about me being a first-generation student. Sometimes that's probably uncomfortable. Uh, for for students, but we try to encourage them that those professors are there and they want to engage with you. They want to answer your questions. They want to kind of help you find your path. And professors always looking for people to to help (laughs) with their research. So uh, talk to those professors about what those next steps are. Talk about what they're doing so maybe they can help, you can help uh, with them in their research. Um, We also have, uh, also the different colleges have their own research. Whatever college or academy we do have, research is available for that in college of education, in fine and applied arts, the ones you might not even think of, research is available for them. So they can go in as early as their freshman year. They know which path they want to go on. And I start asking those questions and get involved. So it is pretty easy. So we have our own office. Uh, colleges are available for, and give you opportunities for research. And the professors that you're taking class with those are usually the three areas where students can ask and get involved in some mm-hmm. kind of research pretty early. Great. Now, I noticed um, you have a couple different honors programs mm-hmm. in different uh, departments. Can you tell us more about those? Well, sure. Uh, usually the, the honor programs, and usually when I talk about honors, uh, people think honors and scholarships are the same. And for us, they are separated. Um, each college has their own honors program. We call it the James Scholars program and it's more of a cohort for students that have achieved pretty uh, high uh, had high achievement during high school and it's an opportunity to kind of they, I guess one of the benefits is that they're able to get in classes a little bit earlier um, they're able to participate in some projects um, that are available to them uh, especially in the in their major or in the in their particular field um, to just give them a kind of a leg up of what those next steps as far as their career is concerned. So the biggest the biggest perks is probably getting courses that they want, and actually they're working with a cohort uh, of, of students uh, to kind of work work through ideas, maybe just through research, just different projects they want to do, or just what their next steps are. Now, what's interesting about the honors program it is a it is a great perk, but those opportunities can be available to students that are not um, in the in the honors program. So it might happen a little bit later, uh, but the biggest perk is that those honors programs are they can students can get involved sooner rather than later. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Let's transition to your admission process because I have quite a few questions uh, pertaining to how you actually get in. So one thing I have to do is give you a shout out. I love how your website, it shows different admit rates for different colleges. Um, I wish every website did that. Uh, But for example, you list a 6.7 admit rate into computer science, 23% into Granger College of Engineering, 27% into Gee School of Business, and then a 68% admit rate into info systems. And 
several other, you know, admit rates. I'm not going to read them all in, in between there. So first question, how do you guard against a student just applying to schools with the highest acceptance rate and then saying they'll do an internal transfer? Because as a counselor, this is a common question that that we get is, oh, like if there's an easier path to get in and I want to take it and I'll get into school and then I'll finagle my way into the program I want to be into. So how does that actually work? Well, for students, it doesn't work exactly <laughs> how they think. Um, <laughs> never those, does. Those admit, yeah, yeah, it never does. Those admit rates are a pretty good mirror of what it's like to just get admitted, period. I'm talking about as an incoming first-year applicant or, or freshman, as a external transfer student, say, from another institution, or even an internal transfer student from University of Illinois. Um, it is, if, there, if you see those admit rates, it is pretty competitive to get in. Uh, one program in particular, computer science, is only available for students that are coming from out, an outside institution. So a high school applicant or a student applying from a, another uh, university into University of Illinois, UIUC. Uh, if you are a current student on campus and you're not in computer science, you will not be able to transfer into computer science. It is that competitive and is that much small amount of space that's available. Uh, other programs like the Geese College of Business, it is pretty competitive. To get into that particular uh, college, um, you have to meet certain um, course requirements, certain grade requirements, and then there's no guarantee you'll get admitted just based on what the space might be as a current student. Uh, the Granger College of Engineering, they actually have an engineering uh, undeclared option for students. They have to meet certain grades and a certain course or course requirements to even get into Granger as an undeclared student. And then they have to meet the requirements to get into the particular program that they're applying to. And again, computer science is not available in that option. Uh, so there is no roundabout way, unfortunately, to get in some of the more competitive programs. If it's, if it's, you see these admit rates and is that competitive to get in as a, as a first year applicant, it's going to be that competitive to get in as even as a current student trying to transfer into that program. So then do you have specific admit rates per major for certain majors or is it all about an admit rate just for the college? Or like, you know, for example, computer science is in a college, right? It's not its own college. So there's a specific admit rate for computer science. Do you have other programs where you're admitting by major or is it just admitting in, like into college in general? Well, no, we, at the at university, we do admit to a particular program. Mm -hmm. uh, we do only have admit rates for the college. Uh, computer science, uh, computer science specifically, uh, because it's so competitive, mm -hmm. because we get so many applications, mm -hmm. we it, we felt that we had to have an admit rate for computer science. Well, this is the number of applications we get. Uh, but the other programs, we do not have, like, uh, we don't have those admit rates available. They're just for the college. Okay. You still apply to a particular program. Mm -hmm. We just don't have the admit rates for those particular programs because they change every year. Okay. Computer so you don't science, publish them. We don't publish them. But individually, <laughs> individually, you're still applying, like you're applying to electrical engineering versus chemical engineering versus That's mechanical. Correct. That was my understanding, yes. the UIUC <laughs> admits by major. So, yes. so, but that's, you just keep that a little confidential. That is that partly because that's where you think people might game the system a little bit if you shared those numbers and they might just go for the higher admit rates or what's the reason for not sharing that? Not necessarily. I, I think uh, they're going to they're going to see the same uh, eight very similar numbers, but they change every year. It's just the college is probably a little more consistent to kind of you get a give you a better picture. And computer science itself, like that that rate is it probably is abnormal compared to everything else. And that's because that's the program we get the most applications to by far. We had to show we had to show that um, a lot of it. We we wanted to try to get more. The, students to see that we have over 150 different programs. We have several different computer science plus X programs. So if they're interested in computer science plus animal sciences or anthropology or chemistry, those options are, uh, are available. It's just that computer science, we get so many different, so many applications. We just like, you have to show this rate to see if this will change students' minds or mm -hmm. you have to see if there's another opportunity, but we, that didn't work because we got a lot of applications from students. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you talk, Mark, I think you mentioned gaming the system mm -hmm. and this might predate you, Brian, but you know, back in the day, everyone knew that if you applied to the agricultural school, that was sort of the back door into 
um, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and then you would do your time there, learn about seeds or cows, and then transfer. And, and thankfully, I think you guys have closed that loophole, and that doesn't exist anymore, which is probably really great. But so what? So I know you can't transfer into computer science, and you ha- <clears throat> it's hard to transfer into engineering and business. Those are pretty competitive. Is there, in terms of the other schools, is there fluidity? Can you transfer back and forth, let's say from the media school to the College of Arts and Sciences, or how does it work for the other schools? Well, we have what we call intercollegiate transfer. And what that means is that they'll, the student will have to complete a requirement for whatever major they're trying to go into. Um, Some programs are obviously have a lot more steps they have more, uh, maybe a broader list of required courses in a certain college EPA. Um, some programs is just filling out a form. Um, um, some programs is just filling out having a certain GPA to be able to transfer into. Uh, so students can uh, transfer uh, back and forth. Some programs might have a little bit more restrictions on how many times you can uh, switch majors. Uh, but for the most part, outside of computer science, students are able to transfer now. Now you have to think about how many, t- how long do you want to be in school? Because um, <laughs> you get into some of those those, those STEM fields, uh, the sooner you know you want to transfer, say, into a STEM program, the better, because they have so many different requirements. And if you wait maybe too late to transfer out, say, of a STEM program, you might have a lot of courses that might not be meet the requirements for your next program to graduate. Uh, so it's something that they'll, especially anything in STEM, having a thorough conversation with their advisor about what their plans are, when, they, when they're thinking about, or hopefully they know sooner rather than later if they want to change. Because uh, anything in STEM, the, the sooner you know, the better. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, as you know, I'm always asking our interviewees what their favorite books are, their books that have impacted them the most in their life. So I thought what I'd do today for our recommended resources, share a book with you that has had a profound impact on my life. And it probably be, would be a book I would list if I was being interviewed and asked the same question. And the book is called Unequal Childhoods, subtitled Class, Race, and Family Life. And you want to get the second edition with an update a decade later. This is by Annette LaRoe. She's a sociologist. At the time, she was at Temple. She's now still in education, but is um, at UPenn. But what she did was she actually lived in the house with, I believe, 82, is in the 80s, um, of third graders to watch and observe the factors that influenced their life, how the parenting style influenced the life. And then what she did, this is why you want to get the second edition. A decade later, she came back to see where are these kids now in their lives. And she wrote a very profound book on the impact of social class as it relates to parenting. And she observed the differences between what upper class, what middle class, working class, and underclass parents did and how it impacts the outcomes of their kids. It's just a real profound book that will really shape your thinking, and I can't recommend it highly enough, and it's a recommended resource for episode 291. So let's go back to sort of the admission process. So like a student could list their first choice major, their second choice major, and let's say they're not admissible to either one. Like let's just say someone said comp sci and engineering. Would they get denied or would you say, well, if they overall meet the admission standard, we can admit you, but we're admit you into general studies or admit you into another pathway? Like how, how does that actually practically work? Well, this year we, we, we there's a different process. In the past for resident students mm-hmm. of Illinois, mm-hmm. if they gave us two choices, um, they were reviewing the first choice or the second choice and they were weren't admissible with both of those, they'll be uh, reviewed um, for our division of general studies. Okay. Uh, we found that we had a lot of students that did not like, uh, if they had these two programs that they listed, they did not like that division of general studies was an option. Mm-hmm. So more t- more students than not chose not to come to Illinois if they were admitted to the division of general studies. Okay. So this year uh, we do not have uh, that policy specifically for, for in, for in-state students. They give us a first choice, a second choice, and not admissible. Then, uh, then, 
that's where the process stops. That's now, a polite way of saying they get denied. <laughs> or, <laughs> <laughs> or denied. The decision will be denied. <laughs> <laughs> now, you differentiated residents and, and non-residents. So is it the same now for residents and non-residents? Did you sort of unify it for everybody on that? First choice, second choice, not in denied, or, or is it different? Well, it's been, it was similar to non-residents and, and international students. Um, the, we, the preference for our Division of General Studies is for our in-state students. Mm-hmm. Um, unless a student applies uh, international non-resident or resident as Division of, Division of General Studies as their first choice, mm-hmm. then obviously they're going to get reviewed there. But it is their second choice. Uh, again, we, have, we give uh, preference to our, our in-state students. Um, now, if a if a student um, does come from um, a I guess a a, uh, a less privileged uh, background mm-hmm. as far as the school is concerned, and the resident of Illinois, the Division of General Studies could be an option. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but for the most part, if students give us two choices and are not admissible, they will be denied. Okay, so <laughs> just so I'm clear on that, because this is important. So, if somebody lists general studies as their first or second choice as an in-state resident, then if they're admissible to the University of Illinois, they can get in through general studies. They don't have to meet the higher bar of like Geese or, you know, or, or Granger or, you know, or something like that. If they're admissible, no. they list first or second choice general studies. And I, and did you say for out of state that they need to list general studies as first choice? I just want to get people. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're truly undecided about their program. Mm-hmm. The vision of general studies should be their first choice. Okay. Okay. And that's true for in-state or out of state? But, yes. Okay. Okay, great. That's that's important. And talk to us once again a little bit about general studies. You brought it up earlier because you said a large number. Did you say like fifty percent, something like that, come in there, come into that pathway? Yeah. Well, well, about twenty five percent of our students are admitted to division of general studies. Okay. About fifty percent of our students change their major and they use advising from division of general studies to kind of either either go into division of general studies to get into another program okay. or just get advising about what the next steps are to transfer into another program. All right. So let's say somebody comes into general studies. Like, what does that look like in terms of their courses, um, their advising? And they don't graduate in general studies, right? Do they eventually transfer into one of the other programs or do they stay there the whole time? No, they'll have to transfer into another program. Right. So uh, what does that look like? General, yeah. In terms yeah, of that so usually process. The, yeah. yeah. Usually like the first, it'll be about it, first two years or so. They're going to take courses, um, some general education courses, um, in consultation with an advisor, if it's a, say, more of a STEM field, they'll probably take courses that are required to get into that particular program. Um, so hopefully they have an idea where they want to go as far as a uh, major is concerned. Uh, the courses that they're taking is not going to hold them back from graduation. So we have a lot of students that still are able to graduate in four years if they start in Division of General Studies. It's just that they, the conversations are very important with that advisor. Uh, about what plans that they have, which programs they're really interested in going into, and building a plan towards uh, the a program or two that they're interested in. So, uh, depending on the program, it could take one year. Um, Sometimes, for most part, it usually takes about two years to build up, especially the more competitive programs, to build up the course that you need and the GPA required to get into that program. So, anywhere between one to two years, they'll be within Division of General Studies. And in our, is it pretty? transparent process like if you hit a certain gpa you know then you're in when you're doing that internal transfer uh from general studies into a program or is it sort of more a holistic thing where there's like an essay and you know and um other aspects of a review or is it pretty much look you need like a three nine to get into this one and a three two to get in this one and a two eight like how does that process work it, it depends on the program and on, on, uh, some of the more competitive programs They'll have a set GPA, but there's still no guarantee they'll get uh, admitted. Like, like engineering, like business, like some of the other uh, science programs, they have to hit a certain GPA. They have to have certain required courses uh, complete uh, to be able to, to, to attempt to transfer. And depending on space capacity, depending on that, that process, it's possible they might not be um, able to go into that program. So that's definitely a possibility. Yeah, no. I was just wondering, um, you know, there's um, so many great community colleges in Illinois. How does um, UIUC work with the community colleges in terms of facilitating transfers? And, like, can you get your first two years, let's say, at the College of Lake County and then transfer into computer science? Or is that just a no-go? 
Oh no, we we work with all the different uh, community colleges. We on our on our website we have what we call the transfer handbook, and you can see what the requirements are for each individual program, including computer science, um, and see what the requirements are. We also have a transfer guide on our website, and this works directly with our community colleges and maybe some other uh, institutions that we get a lot of uh, transfers from. And you'll see, depending on the program you're interested in, what classes that they'll need to uh, take that that will be transferable into uh, the program they're interested in. We also have a user website that's not connected to the University of Illinois, but for the state, it's called Transferology. Dot com and it's a great, another great resource that students can use to see what is transferable from their institution uh, to us. So we do have relations with the Illinois Community Colleges. Um, one of the things that we are we are working on is work, trying to work with the students early, especially for those STEM programs. If they if they know they're going to want to transfer in Illinois, they need to know pretty 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 early on during their freshman year of the community college what they want what they need to take so they have the avail, availability to transfer into uh, University of Illinois. One other thing that actually happened this past year or so, I think it was passed in the law, it was a transfer guarantee uh, program. Um, and that, if a student is admissible to the university, they could be admitted. Now, it's not a guarantee into the program, but they will be admitted into the institution. I believe the uh, requirement is like a 3.0 GPA in 30, 36 transferable hours, and um, they have to be at the Illinois Community College during that time. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that is great. I want to go back to the uh, general studies again, and this time I want to ask you about the advising. So I imagine someone comes in undeclared, especially, you know, somebody really doesn't know what they want to do. Uh, what? Well, tell me what that advising looks like. Like, do they get assigned an advisor right away? Do they meet with them? Is it up to them to schedule their meetings? Is there some kind of structure and regularity? Like, I can imagine some of the students students need a little bit more, you know, hand holding because uh, you have so many options from from there in terms of which college they're actually going to apply into. Yeah, so from what I've been told from our division of studies, they're very intentional about reaching out to those students and making sure they have a have consultation about the courses, uh, even at the beginning of, of their time as a incoming uh, first year student or a transfer student. They have to meet with their um, advisor um, before they register for courses. Um, so that's that's a touch point that they have to have. And with individual general studies, they're like, they're probably a little more intentional than some of the other programs that because they know the students are still trying to figure out what what they want to do, what their path is, uh, what are the next steps for transferring into a different program. So they they do a fantastic job of making sure they're reaching out to the students, so they know who they've met with. They know who they haven't met with. Um, they know um, what each student needs um, as far as just general courses. Uh, everybody's got to take English requirement. Everybody's got to take some kind of math or quantitative requirement. Everyone's taking some kind of science, social science and science. Um, depending on what they came in with, there's a foreign language requirement, depending on the college. Uh, so they, at least they know the basics of what all students will have to take regardless of what program they eventually transfer into. And then each college has their own set of general education requirements that they have to complete. Uh, so Division of General Studies, their advisors there are pretty well versed, but they are very intentional about reaching out to those individuals and making sure uh, they have some kind of touch point uh, for 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 their semester that they're going into. All right. And right now we're going to transition to a topic you're probably sick of getting questions on. Test scores. Uh, Lisa, you want to... <laughs> Yeah, Pick let's us talk off. all about testing. We all love it so much. Um, so you're currently test optional right now. Yes. Um, so what process will you use to determine whether you're going to stay test optional or you're going to start mandating tests like Purdue or you're going to be test blind like Caltech? How are you guys going to decide? Well, that will actually be through the University of Illinois hierarchy. Um, usually the, the board will make that decision and they made that decision over the next few years that we are test optional, both for in-state students and our out-of-state and, and um, international. Uh, but it, it was up to the admissions office. We will be um, continue to be test optional, uh, but it will be the board of University of Illinois that will eventually make that decision. And I know there's going to be research done on um, how students are performing, mm -hmm. uh, both um, ones that had test scores and ones that didn't have test scores. I think early on, uh, you can you pretty much see that, that students are performing at the same level. Uh, so that, but that's early data. Mm -hmm. So I know we'll probably, there'll probably be more extensive research being done 
to find out like if there's any any holes or any gaps. Uh, but I, I think what we're doing now is, I mean, it's, it's kind of showing that we can still do the review process with and without test scores. Great, great. Friends, this concludes the second part of what is a three-part interview. We hope you'll join us next week for the final part. And now it's time for our College Spotlight of the Week. I'm with Linda Depker, and we're here to talk about Occidental College, otherwise known as Oxy. Good morning, Linda. Good morning, Mark. Well, this is kind of exciting for me because, of course, I was the college counselor for both my daughters. And for Karis, uh, we started really getting serious at the end of her sophomore year in terms of doing major visits. And we took this big trip to California. And going into it, I thought Karis, would pro- knowing her, I thought she'd probably end up at one of four places. One of the Claremont Colleges, Oxy, Davidson, or the University of Richmond. Uh, So talking about this just kind of brings back memories from uh, me as a parent taking those trips. But as you guys know, I was, uh, you know, in Southern California for eight days visiting nine schools. And we're going school by school. We did did Caltech last week. We're doing Oxy this week. Um, I'm going to give a description of sort of the flow of the day and then get into who I'd recommend Oxy for. So Oxy's got approximately 2,000 students, all undergrad, located in the Eagle Rock section of Los Angeles. Uh, But you never know you're in LA when you're on the campus. It's completely self-contained, gorgeous campus with that uniform Mediterranean architecture. It's actually one of the oldest liberal arts colleges in the West Coast, founded in 1887 uh, by Presbyterians for men. And, but it's been co-offered, it's been co-ed for over a hundred years. And there's some things I'm not going to say because of all the nine schools here, this is the only one I've done a college spotlight on probably like four years ago when we first started them. So I'm not going to repeat a lot of the stuff I said there, you know, about how people from Princeton founded it and took it west and copied Princeton and all. You can go into detail on that if you're really interested and go listen to that. I'm going to try to supplement it by sharing some different things um, I didn't say um, on that one. But our day started with a beautiful lunch, and then we had the president spoke to us, and then we had a faculty panel, and then after that, we had a tour, and then we had what we all called speed dating, but uh, that was our name for it. But basically what they did, they invited the counselors, there's around 35 of us, up into like five groups of seven, and we sat in a circle, and they had students come in, and they rotated around. Um, and shared different things with us. And then after that, there was like a 90-minute Q&A with different departments. But I actually only attended 20 minutes of that because I realized I wasn't getting a chance to meet my students. So I have three students at Oxy, a tennis player from New Jersey, a runner from Wisconsin, both who are sophomores, and then a freshman who um, attended boarding school in Virginia. And so I sort of skipped out on that last session. It was kind of bad, Linda, because one of the administrators came on and said, it's like, are you coming in here or what? And I was like, skipping school. Yeah, I'm meeting <laughs> with my students, <laughs> which I have no regrets because, uh, you know, you learn as much from them. And it was uh, because everything's done by Zoom. It was the first time I was meeting two of the three of them. So I'm just going to give a recap of um, my main takeaways from each of those phases. So President Elam, uh, very impressive. Uh, and I have to give boxy credit. It's African-American male. And this is the second African-American president that Oxy's had in the last 30 years, but he's one of the world's foremost theater scholars. He comes over from a distinguished career where he pretty much ran all aspects of the undergraduate administration experience at Stanford and really a a really internationally known scholar there. Everybody credited him for being a very good fundraiser and a really good organizer, and the students liked him. He's just, just arrived there in 2020, but he gave a really good speech. He, you know, he talked about key things like the mission, and I like Oxy's mission, which is to provide a gifted and diverse group of students, a total educational experience of the highest quality, and one that prepares for leadership in an increasingly complex, interdependent, pluralistic world. I feel they live up to that. He hit the four pillars of an Oxy education, academic excellence, equity, community, and service, and he talked about how they are infused in the Oxy experience. Uh, but he really hammered home on what he feels makes Oxy unique and distinct more than anything else, and that is the location. That's what sets it apart. B 
being in Los Angeles. And he gave several examples. One example he gave was there was a class that had 15 students and the 15 students formed a task force on sustainability. They built a partnership with the mayor. And when the mayor issued his 60 page report, he incorporated the research that the students had done on sustainability. This is an example of how you interact with the city. So the co-curricular opportunities he felt and the access to LA are what make it distinct from other settings. Um, he also felt the residential environment is distinct in the sense that students know each other, they feel valued, they feel seen, and you can't get lost here. Um, and I would say all these things are completely true. Everything he said is consistent with my experience of the school and knowledge of the school and what I experienced in the you know four or five hours we were on, on campus that day. Um, students are entrepreneurial, curious, and engaged. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of direct mentorship there. Uh, after he spoke, we then had a faculty panel. And the faculty panels, one of the things that's unique about Oxy is it's one of three schools that requires major theses, major undergraduate research for all students, mentored research starting really early on in your experience there. That's something they, once again, they took from Princeton because the Princeton people came over and implemented that. And we've talked about College of Worcester being another. Um, there's other schools that do variations of it, like a read as well. But at this level, um, it's really serious. And so uh, one of the faculty members talked about the senior comps that they have, which which you know, they just call comps and how in-depth they are. And those are, they can be field research projects, art exhibits, or creative works, but they're required in every single major to demonstrate mastery of your subject. And this particular faculty was in sociology, so he talked about how they collect and analyze data, and it's a big lift. Uh, this is not a joke. Uh, they talked about the great advising with professors. They talked about the first-year seminar, which is something they're really proud of. What they do in first-year seminars, they get everybody ready to do college-level work. So it's built around interdisciplinary themes and organized. Um, and the first semester is a tremendous focus on writing, but more shorter writing assignments. And it's also focused on taking evidence that you've learned and verbally presenting your evidence, not just pre verbally presenting your opinion, but presenting the evidence. And then the second semester is a very focus, a very much focused on research and going and finding source sources to of evidence. So there's more time in the library. The papers get longer, still thematic, still interdisciplinary. They cap it at 16. Uh, they talked about how great the Integrative Writing Center is to support students. There's a big emphasis on writing at Oxy. And they also talked about just, they just gave more and more examples of, of the kinds of things that you do with the city. Like one project involves researching sexual violence in the city of Los Angeles and partnering with local attorneys. Um, they, they gave examples of the film festivals. In fact, one thing they do that's really cool, a lot of films are actually held at Oxy and they have a policy that if there's going to be a film at Oxy, you have to take two students that are film majors and have to be part of the crew, uh, which is pretty cool. And then you can't have a film on campus if you're not gonna do that. Most students stay on campus all four years. And so, you know, after that, we we went on tour. And, you know, one of the things about Oxy's has got an energy about it where people dream big. Uh, they dream big, they have big ideas, they they are reflective you can feel the community. You can really feel the community there. And um, it's sort of liberal arts education um, at its finest. So I'm going to make this, as I said, shorter than the other one, because I've already done one on this. And I want to spend some time talking about who I think Oxy is good for. But anything uh, stand out so far, Linda? I like that first year seminar, I think, uh, with that focus on writing, because I think that is such a shock to a lot of students when they when they get to college and they realize how much writing there is and the level it really should be at. And the fact that Oxy just incorporates that into their curriculum, I think that's a, a positive thing uh, to get students really on um, all on the same page. No, I would agree. I would absolutely agree. So who's Oxy good for? Well, if you love a liberal arts education, this is like liberal arts at the finest. And once again, what do I mean by liberal arts? People think liberal as opposed to conservative. No, liberal is an unlocking the mind. So it's an interdisciplinary education. 
where you're going, they're going to train the mind by you taking comp sci with sociology, with philosophy, with chemistry, uh, and mix it all up so you learn to um, see the world differently through a different lens. Strong focus on critical thinking skills, writing skills, speaking skills. Um, it's a residential education where the people learn like it's a living learning laboratory by being a, in the presence of people who are very different from you. Um, small classes, lots of discussion, um, ample faculty interaction. That's the kind of uh, environment I'm referring to when I talk about a liberal a liberal arts education as opposed to um, you know other forms of training. And if you love that, this is sort of a haven for that. Um, you would never sense that the liberal arts are under attack there because people are there to embrace that. In fact, uh, one student I spoke to who was from California, she said her decision came down to Oxy or UCI, you know, University of California at Irvine, where so many of her friends went. And she said, boy, am I ever happy I came here. She's like, my classes have all been between 6 and 30. Um, and every one of my professors knows me by name and knew me by the second week, my first and last name. Um, and that's just not the experience that my peers are having that chose different alternatives. So if you want to be if you want to be connected to a major city, um, opportunities are limitless with LA in your back door. Uh, you know, this is an example of why I say throw the rankings out. If you look at rankings, you'll see Oxy 30 to 40 in that range in liberal arts and science schools. This is mostly based on just peer selectivity. But I mean, there's a unique opportunity here because if you want that style of an education and you want to be in a major city, what are your options? Well, you've got Whittier, which is also in L.A., which is up next week. You've got McAllister in Minneapolis, St. Paul's. You've got Barnard in New York, Trinity in Hartford, Morehouse and Spelman in leading HBCUs in Atlanta, Richmond in, in Richmond, Rhodes in Memphis, and Reed and Lewis and Clark in Portland and Santa Fe and St. John's in Santa Fe. That's about it. If you want to go to a school like this in a city, and then some of those schools aren't eligible for everybody, a couple HBCUs, women's colleges. So when you really look at what liberal arts schools are in a major city, really, McAllister, Minneapolis, St. Paul is a pretty major city. And, you know, Whittier and, um, and, and Oxy in, in L.A., really, um, if you take out the HBCUs and the women's colleges. So it's a small number. Um, Portland's a pretty major city too. So uh, let's throw in Reed and Lewis and Clark. But there's not a lot. It's a small number. And there's just a lot of advantages with how they access the city. So I would say that would be would be something really of note about Oxy. I agree with the president. Um, and he's coming from Stanford and sort of noting the difference being in L.A. versus Palo Alto. So uh, a humanities major we spoke to. Uh, she loved her study in the humanities, but she also loved her work at the National History Museum. And she wouldn't have had that if she wasn't right in L.A. So I can't emphasize that enough. Another thing is I would recommend uh, Oxy for people that want to live in a community. There's a friendliness there. You can feel the community. You can feel the vibe. There's a sense of people working together. We're in it together. Now, here's the other side. And, you know, some I heard this from some of my students. It can feel small sometimes. If you, it can feel like the fishbowl. If you're someone who likes more anonymity, sometimes, you know, you may not get that as much in that kind of environment. If you want to want that ability to sort of go invisible, so you know that cuts both ways. So I would say the person that really wants that very strong community vibe, that sense of togetherness, that sense of I know these people, they know me. It's 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 really good for that. If you want to be really develop your critical thinking and your writing, and your research. Uh, this is a school that really emphasizes research. Now, I know Caltech emphasizes research as well, but Caltech is mostly science-based research. They have that here, but they also have research in social sciences, in the visual arts, in the humanities, in the natural sciences, in math. Uh, one student was doing research on a unique flock of parrots in the L.A. area through her evolutionary biology class in ecology that have been in LA for a hundred years. Um, they have a program there. It's called REAP. Um, it's a fantastic program. It's an acronym for research early action program. It's paid research over the summer. You're like, well, this sounds like surf from last week. You know, once again, it's a wide range of topics. So you get to pick three subjects 
and they'll get back to you with one of the three. They pair you with a professor and you do all kinds of paid research. So one student did, who we met with, she did biochem research, studying the myoglobin proteins and denaturing work with an enzyme called P415. Way over my head, by the way, Linda. Didn't know what she was talking about. Over my head as well. But she said she got paid a lot of money. It was 10 weeks, free housing, free food. She said, I don't know where else I would get this opportunity. Uh, her roommate was doing research on music and artificial intelligence. Uh, some other students did research on how soccer fans in the 80s and 90s were integral to social movements in Europe. So it's a place that nurtures your idiosyncrasies. Um, and if that's appealing to you, you know, that's cool. It's a place that really has, I'd say, true work-life balance. It's challenging. It's definitely challenging. But a slightly above average student who works hard can do well at Oxy. You don't have to be a one percenter. You know, um, you can get by with hard work if you're slightly above average. They know how to work hard and play hard. It's also a place for, for students who value things like multiculturalism, social justice, um, and equity. If, if you're sort of more into the anti-wokeness, you probably would hate this place. It would probably feel very politically correct and very liberal. Um, it is a left-leaning institution. In fact, I had conversations with a couple of my students, one who's really into politics, and he's really left-leaning. And he was saying, you know, one thing I don't like here, I like to debate politics all the time, but almost everybody has your view here, so I can't find people that have a different view than me. <laughs> and the other student who's kind of left-leaning but was coming from a more conservative environment, she was like, I like it. I don't have to be around all those views that drove me crazy in high school. So it's just different perspectives, but it is it is definitely a liberal community. There's no question with that. And you'll find that quite a bit in the California schools. So you'll be hearing me say some of this when we talk about some of the other schools as well. It's a place where it's just really strong. They have 45 majors and minors, and they're just good in a lot of them. Like biology is fantastic. International relations, psychology, sociology, economics. I mean, they are the only provider of a residential academic semester program in the UN, which is why uh, my student from Virginia selected the school over you know, over the, all the other really strong schools in international relations. But they also have other programs that may be smaller, like film and music production, marine biology, that have unimaginable opportunities. And it's a place that has tremendous access to faculty. It's a place where students dream big, and it has just a very positive, healthy vibe about it. The, the access to resources whether it's student counseling, whether it's student advising, whether it's the career center, they're, they're really plentiful. So uh, I feel it fits a lot of people because there are a lot of people that are looking for, for that kind of education. And so I don't regard it as a niche school at all. It's a school that just can fit quite a few kids. So that's it. Said I'd make it short and sweet this week. Any final thoughts, Linda? I think it's a fantastic school and uh deserves more of a national reputation. Uh, some of those programs are amazing. I love the the semester at the UN. Such a unique program for students. Uh, I'm, I'm an Oxy fan. Yeah. And, you know, Barack Obama started up there. So he sort of put a lot of them on the map and they have the Barack Obama scholars. They're proud of their Barack Obama. So, yeah. So next week up, the only other uh, liberal arts and science school in the city this size what are your college? So hopefully you join us next week. Thanks, Linda. See you then. Friends, on Monday's episode, Hillary Dickman is back. And based on the last Monday, you received what she had to say very well. We had an outpouring of favorable responses, both to that interview as well as to Gus the previous three weeks. But now Hillary will be discussing a whole brand new topic, a creative way to figure out how many spots are available at a selective college for somebody like you. So we'll be talking about that. Of course, we'll be doing our higher ed updates. And friends, I can't leave without saying it's not where you go. It's what you do when you get there and get out of there. See you on Monday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, 
please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 14. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Talianos Dimitriou. If you want to have a coaching session with Lisa or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. By the way, check out our website, where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Thursday.